Podcast with your host, Chris Griffin, aka Chris with a K, that guy, Seth Oliveris. Seth, what's up? How you doing today? Feeling really good. Yeah, especially uh, with the stuff going on in my own life as far as school and stuff. I just wrapped up a pretty mean uh, past couple days, but yeah, now I'm I'm almost smooth sailing to, to this weekend, but yeah, I'm feeling good. Man, I'm I'm dreading this weekend simply because I'm gonna have to watch the game on my phone. <sighs> Thank God for YouTube TV. This will be the last fall wedding that I ever go to, no matter if I'm in it or, or whatever the case may be. Right. I'm I'm perfectly fine. It's one of my law buds, so it's cool. But at the same time, like, come on, man. Seriously. Think about it. Like, you know, hey, so uh <laughs> But uh, man, with that being said, we are upon the game of the freaking century, or maybe it's not the game of the freaking century. But before <laughs> we get to that, uh, let's go over the good, the bad, and the ugly from the game against Western Carolina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we both we both agree on the. There really wasn't much ugly. The only thing we could point to was probably the the injury uh, status. Uh, like you know, so we saw in the game, uh, Danny Sutzman uh, looked like he might have like dislocated his elbow or something. So that you know, time will tell how long he'll be out. But luckily, you know, he's a young guy, so he wasn't expected to to play a huge role in OU's defense right now. But um, yeah. yeah, so and then you know, from uh, Lincoln Lincoln Riley's press conference earlier this week, he. Uh, let it be known that a couple more guys are going to be out for this weekend, at least uh, Woody Washington and Billy Bowman, two, two, two pretty impactful uh, Sooners. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely like the, over this last week, uh, that's probably the ugliest part of it. But I mean, I think all things considered, it's, it's not too bad. It thinks it'd be a whole lot worse. That's for sure. So, uh, but, but what about you? What are you, what are you kind of looking at as far as ugly or maybe even just something that's bad? So uh, what I would say, the only, I mean, besides the injuries, uh, the only ugly part about Saturday was just the fact that the game was on pay-per-view. That's pretty (laughs) ugly. I mean, I think everybody, hey, you know, look, for whatever happens in the SEC, the one thing that I can say that I'm most excited about is no more pay-per-view games. Oh, oh, please. um, No, I mean, those injuries, you hate to see Stutzman go out simply because, you know, that keeps Brian Mead off the field. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll shout definitely out to Brian say, Mead. Yeah, I shout out to Brian Mead. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, you're, you're, looking, you're looking at it at this way is that, you know, um, you want to see Billy Bowman get more reps. But I think a lot of people, you know, you hear Layman. I talk to my own, talk to a lot of people. A lot of people out there are excited about the prospect of, uh, I mean, the possibilities that you have with uh, not only Cradell at that position, but also uh, playing Turner Yale down there as well. You know, you see, you're you seeing Grinch kind of uh, relax with that safety position as far as putting Turner Yale down there in that nickel uh, position. And you're seeing now as you can, you can sub in uh, Key Lawrence, uh, and I, I even think there's still room for, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bryson Washington to come out there and, and, and possibly get some reps. So I guess we'll see with that. Um, you hate to see Woody and, uh, and and Bowman out, but, man, just think about what this team is going to be able to grow towards and then also what they're going to have later in the season when you get uh, not only Woody and a healthy Bowman back because most likely they'll probably be back around the West Virginia or K-State games. But then you got to think about you're going to have your full arsenal back because at some point in time, the hope is is that uh, Theo Weiss will be back. So, you know, this definitely um, is giving us uh, a lot more film uh, to kind of, you know, and a lot more time to get rest or whatnot. I'm not going to say that I'm taking the breath mm-hmm. lightly, but I'm just saying I feel confident in what we're going to do. And, um I'll go ahead and segue right into the, you know, I guess what I thought was a good, which was just the consistency. Uh, you really don't learn anything new or spectacular from that game. You just see what you thought you would see in the first game, which was just a dominating uh, effort on both sides of the ball, all three phases of the game. What about you, Seth? 
Yeah, I'm right there with you. There's really not a whole lot that was uh, that we learned from this game. But the one thing, and I think you'll agree with me, the one thing that I really like to see, and I know it's Western Carolina, but anybody who's been watching OU football, at least under Lincoln Riley, <clears throat> they know that it's he's kind of had a reputation of almost not having that killer instinct. Yeah. I mean, he, it, when he knows that he's just put a team away, he'll he will pull he will call the dogs off. Like I mean, look at last year against Missouri State. They they had like forty two or something at halftime, and they ended, they finished the game forty eight nothing. Like they could have they could have kept going. And yeah, it's like it's not about running up the score necessarily, but it's about even though you're using your second and third string guys, mm-hmm. you know, in those late late in those games like that, <clears throat> you still want to you still want to run everything you're running. You just you're just not using your your top guys, mm-hmm. and I think this was a, a it was nice to see that even though you know Caleb Williams came out there after Spencer Rattler, and then even you know beyond that they even they went deeper and you know across the board on offense and defense there were new guys, they were still running what OU would normally run. They were just using guys that a lot of people you know they are not household names. So and then therefore we get the seventy six nothing score, which I think is reflective of that because. Yeah, I think if this if this game was played last year or the year before, OU probably only you know OU probably stopped scoring around fifty. Just that's no. just what Lincoln Riley. It just seems like. So I'm wondering if maybe he's got if he's starting to adapt a little more of like a killer instinct. I know it's kind of weird to apply that in a game like this, but we'll we'll be able to see if if it translates in games in the future when you know like, like this weekend if if OU's putting it on Nebraska like. Are they going to stop? You know, like when when do it? Like, what does that look like? So it gives well, me a little optimism. I would say that. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of people could take a dig at Lincoln and say killer instinct, killer instinct. But um, I think one of the the biggest problems that we've had as far as trying to close that gap with an Alabama, um, maybe even a Clemson or so. Oh, he's always had a talent. They're the most talented team in the, in the Big Twelve. Uh, one of the most talented teams in the country, obviously, is shown. But one of the biggest things is that when you go down the depth chart, you didn't have those type of guys who can still go out there and be productive. So, I mean, you go and look at um, Alabama and what, as they've been killing teams as well. Well, there's not – okay, so it's supposed to be like this right here. Your number one guy, your quarterback, is supposed to be elite. But at the same time, there shouldn't be that much of a drop off whenever you're running the same system, same plays with the next guy. We have two five stars um, that's, that are playing for us. If Spencer was not uh, here right now, I'm sure Kevin Williams will be starting. So it shouldn't be that much of a drop off. He should be able to lead um, that second unit, even some of those third string guys uh, down the field to, you know, go on scoring drives or whatnot. And, you know, when you look at those players or whatnot, they're all, I mean, so a lot of people will say it's a subtraction to the hype or to the overall, you know, flow of the game. And I get it. You're not getting guys in um, positioning to build, uh, um, you know, not, not only chemistry with each other, but just kind of build a flow for themselves in the game. However, the fact that you're rotating so many guys just shows the talent on the depth chart. It shows that this team is deep and that there's not a significant drop off. Somebody gets injured, it's the next guy up. We will be fine week to week. And we're going to get those guys back. But, um, you know, I, I definitely think it's, it's that much of a big deal about his killer instinct. I think that Lincoln does need to stop taking the foot off the gas. If you go all the way back to, I believe, 2018 against Georgia. Hello. Oh, but, you know, um, at the same time, uh, I think that you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You know, I'd like to see the red zone efficiency be a, a lot better, but at the same time, with with two scholarship backs, granted, Knowles and, and and Hudson did look pretty good. You know, in that blowout victory over Western Carolina, you're still saying, you know, our two, you know, horses in the backfield, we can't we can't risk getting one of them them injured. We gotta, you know, preserve that. So I definitely uh, that was a bright spot of the game getting to see. Um, Eric Gray not being being as hesitant as he uh, was in uh, week one. Um, you know, obviously, Kennedy Brooks is just consistent. You know what you're going to get from him day in and day out. Yeah. Uh, and I still think that he's knocking off the rust as well. But Yeah, he definitely he, is. Yeah, when you look at Eric Gray, Eric Gray is, is like, you know that he's one, one, one shed tackle away from just making a spectacular play, but you're looking at him just saying, hey, 
you got to find that mix between being patient and also being impatient as far as dancing in the backfield. Like you got to find that happy medium and just hit that go button. But I'm definitely excited from what I saw uh, just because of the consistency and just because of what you want to see all four quarters and see what's going on. So, you know, speedy recovery to the guys. I'm sure they'll be back. I'm sure Danny Stutzman will be back sometime during the, during the year. If not, then, I mean, this is just another great time for him to kind of sit back and learn the game even more, learn the scheme, and then just be back. He's a young guy. But, um, you know, I do expect him to hopefully be back and do to be a big part of this, uh, this title run. Um, so now that we're done with Western Carolina, I believe you got anything else you have to say? No, nah, yeah, that, there's not much to talk about. Yeah, well, I think we 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 beat that that drum enough. So uh, I'm I think we're both ready to move on to the big one. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to the OU Nebraska game this weekend. So uh, first off, Seth, let's go ahead and get it out of the way. What's your what is your prediction? What's your score prediction? Oh man, a score prediction. I don't. So I think last I saw OU's favored by about 22. Yeah. Roughly. So yeah, about 20. So I'm I've just been having this weird feeling all week that it's just gonna be closer. And no, and not because of Nebraska is that good or OU is, you know, isn't as good as they they, you know, people say they are. Like it just it's just that weird. It's just it's just because there's every reason for OU to blow out Nebraska that I feel like I just maybe I'm just you know, part of it, I think, or I know part of it is because of just what's happened to OU. And it seems like every year for the last however many years now, they just, the, the moment you think you're as confident in them as possible, like they're going to, they're going to drop something. So because of that, I'm just going to let them prove it to me. And if they end up blowing out Nebraska, then I'll be the first one to be celebrating. But for now, I'm going to go OU wins. But I got this one. I'm going to say, 42 to 27. Okay. So let's take, let's attract 10 from your score. I'm going 42 17. So the reason why I say that, I saw your tweet last night and I wanted to just, you know, directly respond to that today. (laughs) So basically, in my mind, I can tell you exactly how this game is going to go. Um, Go back to 2019. Um, 2019's game against Texas Tech. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're working with uh, the first quarterback that they had come out there. Okay. He wasn't getting the job done. They put in Jet Duffy. Jet Duffy is mobile. Jet Duffy isn't the greatest passer. He honestly isn't the greatest scrambler, but at the same time, he can get the job done. And so, uh, uh, shout out to Jet Duffy. I don't even know if he's starting. When did he, did he transfer to like Central Michigan or something? I, I think that sounds right. That sounds okay. right. Like it's somewhere like that. It was somewhere like that. But but basically, my point my point being is is that um, you're working against a quarterback that um, I'm sure that he's going to have some bootleg actions. They're going to run motion just like Tulane. Uh, that's the beauty of it is that Nebraska kind of runs a gadgety offense, kind of like. Um, um, uh, two lane as well. So I'm sure that you'll see a couple of rollouts with uh, uh, Martinez, Adrian Martinez to get him in a rhythm as well. Um, you're not going to see, I, I don't think you'll see a big running day for uh, by them. I think you'll see a bunch of screens. They're going to be competitive. They have a decent front seven in my, and honestly, from what I've seen in the Illinois game, they have a decent front seven. Um, uh, he's broke two, two big uh, quarterback runs Two big quarterback scrambles. I don't know if they were by design or not, but I know that Martinez has um, proven this year that he's a threat. But he's also still putting the football on the on the field, I mean on the turf as well. So he uh, is definitely prone to fumble, and it seems like OU is getting the fumble a game now. So uh, yeah. yeah, I just looked that up. There, I think they're tied for the lead in the nation with uh, like five fumble recoveries. I think that OU will be up for this game. I think they'll definitely be um, excited to play this game, but I also think they'll be pissed off as well. Um, you come into the year, you were two, now you're three, obviously. Uh, and I think that, you know, with the way that 
I, I think that you're kind of what you saw in that Western Carolina game was I'm hungry now. I'm sorry. I wasn't starving. Like I said, I was, I was, but I'm hungry now. Like feed me, like, let me go ahead and, and get on. And I, I think that nine times out of 10, OU um, destroys Tulane. Oh, but it's oh, always yeah. that one time when you overlook that team. So every team is good for one time. All you have to do is be better than that team right. on the field that day. Yeah, for so, sixty minutes. Just. Yeah, you can't you can't take it for granted anymore. You got to play all sixty minutes and be and be dumb and be dominating on the ball. Um, I'll be interested to see if we see a lot of subs this game. I think you'll see more of um, a flow for some players. Definitely, I think from what I saw and from what I'm hearing is it looks like McCutcheon is probably going to get another start uh, this weekend. So that to me, I think that speaks volumes. Your redshirt freshman is, is getting is getting a start, and it, you know that just shows the talent that he has. Yeah. Two years removed from an ACL, and just I mean, going to be the beast that he's supposed to be. I mean, you're looking at McCutcheon and Bowman is saying those two, those are the two right there for sure. Those are the two for sure. Um, you yeah, know, those are like, that are going like the pillars of the secondary, like for the future. Yeah, not only secondary for the future, but you're just looking at just the the draft possibilities. Oh, you know, oh yeah. You know, you look at a guy like um, uh, uh, Cradell. You look at a guy like Turner Yale. Um, I feel like they're going to follow the same path as a Trey Norwood, as a Trey Brown. They're going to, you know, be probably, you know, third day type guys, second day type guys that. Uh, get a shot in the league and just run with it. I think that you got a lot of talent on the field, but you know you just see that star factor, that hit factor with you know Bowman and and, and McCutcheon. So there's a lot of things to be to be uh, excited about going forward. But um, back to the Nebraska game, uh, I think that you're working against. Um, like I said, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna work. You're gonna have a team that's gonna work that field, and you're gonna have to be ready. But like I said, I think OU is gonna be amped up for the game. The stadium is probably going to be rocking. It's going to be oh, rocking. Yeah. So, I mean, 11 a.m. kickoff, let's get it. Let's go. And, um, you know, Bob Stoops is going to be on it. It's, it's going to be a hell of a show. So, um, I, I think that you're looking at that game because you're, you're telling them, like, hey, we can't take any days off. We got three big games. We got we got a, we got a hell of a four-game stretch. We should blow out Nebraska, should blow out West Virginia. Um K State losing their quarterback for the year. That only school hot, but at the same time, it's still got Deuce Vaughn. It's still got Deuce Vaughn. Yeah. And, uh, you know. And back I, quarterbacks are just. Yeah. You yeah, never know with them. You, you know, you know um, Ruben Patterson in the NBA used to go around and say, I'm the Kobe stopper. And people would be like, the Kobe stopper. And he'd be like, yeah. And they'd be like, bro, he had like 40 on you. And he'd be like, yeah, but I made him take 35 shots to get 40. And people were like, ah. <laughs> but, I mean, that's pretty much what Scott Thompson is. Scott Thompson is like, yeah, now he scored 50 on us too, but we scored 55. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, but, yeah no, you got a four-game stretch that you can't let up. You got to. You gotta, 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 gotta be focused, and I think that you're gonna get a focus on you. I think these next four games are gonna be telling, especially ending with Texas. Yeah. Well, well first, I, I want to touch on what you said earlier. Like a pissed off OU team. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they come in pissed off, oh yeah, it's it's over. It's a wrap. Yeah. Sorry, Nebraska, but like I'm, I'm glad you showed up. I hope you hope you enjoy your time here in Oklahoma. But it's not. It's not going to be fun on that field, but yeah. And then I think I tend to agree, especially because of how the two lane game went dropping two spots in the rankings, everything that was said on social media. I know, I know the players saw that. I mean, they were tweeting, some of them were tweeting about it, you know, talking about, you know, little kind of uh, just uh, vague remarks or something about it, but just, but yeah, that was like a week uh, over a week ago, but, but yeah, that's it. I, they're, they're dialed in. So it's, that that's what definitely gives me pa, uh, or, or hope for uh, to see what I want to see. <laughs> but yeah, as for uh, some uh, less uh, less green green pastures uh, down in the forty acres. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, 
Seth, if, if if you would, I think that the good people that listen to our podcast, and we we want to thank everybody who listens to our podcast um, and watch us on YouTube as well. Um, but uh, this is a moment in time where I would say, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll do some definitely do some post editing if you don't mind. But I, I think the people should see and hear. Uh, the video that that was dropped uh yesterday the shot heard around the world uh it's oh. it's look it's going viral it's called dearest uncle <laughs> and it, look it's it's people it's worth your time okay. Dear gold dearest uncle i bring you good news from our allies in fayetteville the razorbacks were victorious in their battle with those wretched longhorns general Pittman and company rushed the enemy to crush their spirit early in the battle. I'm told that Captain Sark and company retreated. We hope to send reinforcements to the men from Rice within the next few days to ensure that Captain Sark and his men are defeated again. My hand trembles from excitement whilst writing this, as we have finally gained a momentous victory whilst enduring myriad months of the Texas faithful's pompous belligerence. As always, there is only one. Boom. Texas, how are you doing? Texas Faithful, Nino's Corners, Fanatic Perspective, Steve and Nick, what's up, my guys, man? Wow. Uh, Seth, I'm going to let you start on, on, on Arkansas and Texas because I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I mean, they they are who we thought they were, you know? Like, Texas was just is, – is still now and probably forever will be a pretender – and like that, I knew that ranking, that high ranking, that top fifteen rank, was not gonna last. We both predict. I think we both predicted uh, Arkansas to win, and it wasn't just you know us hating on Texas. Like, oh. it's just you. It's Texas just not ready for that. They 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 haven't ever shown, you know. And now they're in the the Sark era, but even in the in the Herman era, you know, and obviously the Strong era, they 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 have never shown that they're ready to to play with expectations and to, to play with, uh, uh, success. Like they, they don't know how to, they, yeah, they, they, they just don't know how to handle success. They have one solid win against a Louisiana team. That's, I mean, it's still Louisiana. Like, yeah, it's, 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 it's not a power five team, but they're, they're, they're okay. They had one, you know, gr- good game against them. And then they just, it just looked like they just completely forgot how to, how to operate as a program. And this showed by them getting just completely stomped in Fayetteville, which it was not even as close as the final score indicated. That that 19 point win, that sh- Arkansas should have dropped 50 on them. They, they they were they were in victory formation in the in the inside the 10 yard line, I believe. And then there was you know just other chances where they just you know they they had to settle for like four or five different field goals in the red zone. So maybe that's a little credit to Texas, but also just it's still Arkansas, yeah. not a great team. Well, and it just, well, I mean, it just showed that they just, they just weren't ready for them hogs. So what I would say to that point is just the fact that, I mean, KJ Jefferson is still, uh, is he a redshirt freshman? I believe he's a redshirt freshman. But <laughs> I think so either, too. Either way, it's his first actual, you know, like, hey, I'm the guy now. Felipe Franks was the guy last year, but you're looking at KJ Jefferson, you're saying. He made the necessary. He made the throws when it when necessary. I think the problem with him going forward is just seeing how what's his what level of consistency are you going to get from him? Because they have every they have every opportunity to be a really good team to be above above average, which they've been. No, they've been below average for years, but yeah, now they could be above average. But I mean, just the complete dismantling of Texas on all three phases of the football. Uh, every phase. Yep, you're yeah. right. Yeah, every I mean, one. It was, it was, it was really telling. Um, do I think? Do I think that this game bears anything on the Red River game? No, no, no. We know that they'll come out there, and for some odd reason, they'll be able to <laughs> block. They'll magically be able to block. They magically be able to 
to they'll be able to uh, they'll they'll run like they'll run like a two man front and be able to get pressure somehow. <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's just weird stuff like that that happens in that game. But um, I definitely think that uh, Texas owes Arkansas an apology for what they put on the field that night. It was not great at all. But I mean, just to see, you know, you you go back to when it was sixteen zero. Uh, B.J. Foster got that uh, interception, which was a pretty nice play. Set them up yeah. for a touchdown. They got the touchdown. And you're you're looking at the game saying, okay, well, maybe Texas has more, mo- uh, more more momentum. But then you look at Arkansas say, all right, all right, all right. Let's not get too freaky with the scheme a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Let, 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 let's go back to what was working for us. And they started pounding the football. And Texas wanted none of that. They <laughs> wanted none of that. And it's just really telling. And I mean, you know, watching, you know, my uncle for sure called me and said, man, I've watched just about everybody's podcast. He was like, what's your friend's name? The guy, Nino's Corner, that guy for for that perspective. (laughs) It's like, I watched theirs too. Yeah, it's bad. Every they all (laughs) sad. But it just shows you, here's my thing. It's funny because Texas fans O State fans, haters in the Big 12, and haters around the SEC love to come to our doorsteps and say, so you guys are unrealistic uh, with your expectations. And I'm like, so we're unrealistic thinking that we got a shot to win the college football playoffs once we make it. And what I'm what I mean, what my point with that is, is that Texas fans come and say, you're unrealistic with your expectations. You're just gonna make it to the college football playoff game and get blown out. At least we make it. At least we make it. Y'all, yeah. y'all gotta y'all need to start going and scheduling Missouri State, Western Carolina, and Boise State <laughs> and make Boise State your your best non-conference game because it makes no sense. You can't. You already can't go back. You can't go back to Maryland. <laughs> and now you're looking at Arkansas, saying that. I mean, well, you know, we're going to be in the same conference soon. Do you guys just want to like try to not play and not be in the same pod? Because you're going to have to deal with those problems. The only team that I would say Texas will get up for and Texas will be able to beat will be Texas A&M. Outside of that, there will be no <laughs> other team inside there pod inside their division that they will be able to go toe-to-toe against. They better hope they get Vanderbilt. But <laughs> man, it just didn't make any sense. But I don't know. You know, we 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 love to joke and everything, but let's let's seriously break it down. Um we'll save the quarterback play and that for the next topic. But I would just say, you know, I think Texas fans gotta realize you can't expect B. John Robinson to bounce off of three and four guys and be able to take it four yards for a touchdown every play. He's great. He's magical. But, I mean, you know, Nick, he was on our show, and he started yuck, screaming out Adrian Peterson. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not going to put Adrian Peterson in the same category um, with B. John Robinson. Not this, not this early in his career. Uh, then you start going. You go. You go to the to the wide receiver play, Xavier Worthy or or, or whatnot. I, he was non-existent. Whittington was missing. Uh, was was dropping passes. He dropped that one touchdown pass. Josh Moore. I don't even hear about him anymore. Uh, he's like Casper <laughs> Friendly Ghost. He's there, but you don't know he's there. You know? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, and do they even have a tight end? <sighs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know if Sark likes <clears throat> using tight ends, but I, I really don't. I wouldn't be able to tell you who their best one is. I mean, he used one at uh, at at Alabama. Billingsby was a uh, was a tight end. So, I mean, I don't know. But just <clears throat> then, you go to the defensive side of the ball, and it's just. I mean, no. Let's let's stay with offense. They they're running a three man front. How the hell are they getting that much pressure with a three man front? But that's I think, bad. I keep telling people it's still an SEC level defense. Right. So, you know, this is not your typical K State, Iowa State. This is a, this is a freaking big. Uh, this is a SEC style defense. They're going to be fast and they're going to be fine. Um, then you go to the defensive side of the ball, and Seth. I mean, just damn. 
Like, you know, couldn't stop a thing. Yeah, we sit up here and, and praise Alfred Collins and and they got Coburn and all the rest of those guys that are supposed to have a hefty, uh, you know, uh, front seven, but you're looking like, man, like, y'all, you guys couldn't do anything. They were more physical than you. Their quarterback was more physical in the trenches than either than, than your D line or O line. I mean, it it was crazy. What were your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I mean, I think the most glaring uh, kind of a, or even alarming area, which is it's actually an area that a lot of people, both Texas fans and uh, other fans alike, pointed out to this offseason was the, the the offensive line. And I know I've been see I've been uh, perusing some Texas message boards. I've watched you know some uh, you know, some Texas faithful videos, and a lot of them are, are kind of questioning uh sarkeesian and the the staff at texas on why they didn't go out this offseason and try to shore up the offensive line maybe through the portal or so because people were asking for them to do that you know thinking they should do that and i i guess they just didn't deem it as like oh necessary or they thought their their offensive line situation was better than it was but they just got completely exposed and i mean they even got exposed to an extent against louisiana you just didn't see it because louisiana's uh defensive front that they just don't have the, the horses up front to necessarily do damage against them but they weren't holding up well really against them either but it, they once they finally went up uh, against a team that has comparable talent um and just you know just athletic athleticism it, it showed that they they're not even close to where they need to be to to have even even like a, a an offense that would rank in the top half of the Big 12. Like they're if they can't block, they they clearly can't run block. Because I mean, if you if if Bijan Robinson isn't even a, is is only averaging barely three yards a carry, then like that's saying something because that dude, I mean, he's like a walking first down. Like you yeah. know, with with decent with decent blocking. And, you know, just all credit to him. But, yeah, like you can't even get him to go in. And so – and then t- the teams now – now it's it's on tape now that teams know that about Texas, about that offensive line. Mm-hmm. I think we're just going to keep seeing this. I don't – I really I – don't, I don't think this is an adjustment they're going to be able to make midseason. You know, you can't just add all of a sudden depth and talent on your offense on, – on any position uh, on the – you know, during the season, that's going to have to come later, but they're, they're going to be paying the price for that, I think, for the next next 10 weeks or so. I mean, it, it's no secret what what people were going to do. Hell, Bryce is going to do it this weekend, too. Load, yeah. the, load the effing box. Load the <laughs> F out of that. And go and tell Casey Thompson, Hudson Card, Sarkeesian, I mean, hell, I don't know. Whoever else you want to throw out there, Colt McCoy, tell them, <laughs> make the play. Like, that's the thing, is that Josh Moore and all the rest of them are going to be have to be dominant on the, on the perimeter. They're going to have to be dominant. They're going to have to be that guy. You, Texas doesn't have a threat out there. So the problem with Texas offense is the fact that people don't respect your passing game. So they're saying, yeah, that's great. I saw you nickel and diamond. I saw. I, I know you can throw the deep pass, but we're not going to let up anything big. But what we are going to do, we're going to make sure that Bijan doesn't have a great day. He may have 100 yards, but it's going to be on 30 carries. And exactly. if he, Yeah, if he has a touchdown, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. You know, make him work for it. Don't give it to him. Um, I feel like I feel like Bijan is going to get the same treatment that a Chuba Hubbard would where – you know, Chuba, you know, people, they have high hopes for him to be able to get another 2,000-yard season like uh, I think Deontay Foreman did, or Deontay Foreman, however you say his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're looking at looking at them and saying, well, that's still unrealistic because the fact of the matter is, is that Casey Thompson is a question mark and Hudson Card – you know that he has talent, but he's a bigger question mark right now. He's rattled. Now he just lost his position as the starting quarterback. And now you know they're both going to play in this Rice game. But at the same time, you know, I guess my question is, do you think that Casey Thompson is going to come out there and set the world on fire? Or do you think that it's going to be same old, same old Texas? In this game, for sure, against Rice, 
I do expect him to come out and they're going to, they're probably going to score on most, if not every possession that he's out there. I think they're going to come out mad and just angry and want to like correct stuff. But I think going forward, I think they're just, they're, they're going to have issues because I, from what I was hearing during the off season, even though they, you know, Sarkeesian said that it was a really close uh, race uh, as far as between Hudson card and Casey Thompson, the, it seemed like the, one of the main differences was that Hudson's ceiling is a little bit higher. And then while Casey might be a little more consistent, he's, he has a higher tendency to like turn the ball over. Yeah. He's a little, so I feel like that's going to creep up once, once the competition steps up again, which is going to be right after this rice game for the rest of the season, basically um, they're going to, they're going to be playing teams that are going to be able to exploit that. They're going to be able to, they're going to put Casey in those positions where he's going to want to try to make a play yeah. um, and he's going to make probably the wrong decision just based on his history and what he's, what he's shown um, in previous outings. But yeah, I think for this weekend, he's going to look really good. And then when, uh, when card, when they do put card in there for however long they, they, they have him in there, I think he's going to look all right as well. That's mostly just because of it's, it's rice, but I still think rice is going to show that they still got issues. Like they're, they're going to expose some things like, and that's, it's just, I, it, I would not, <laughs> I'm glad I'm, I'm always glad I'm not a Texas fan, but I'm, I'd be really especially worried right now because it's this is like I mean they never saw this I think if, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong but this was the worst uh, loss than even Tom Herman ever had as far as like points go yeah. so like somebody was screaming for Tom Herman to be hired back and I was like wait a minute wait a minute I feel like I feel like uh, uh, I feel like old boy's uh, dad off of Friday. Whenever uh, he went over there and asked for his bike back from Debo, <laughs> and when he got punched, and his dad got in the car and said, "I told you about messing with these damn people." <laughs> That's Arkansas. Arkansas over there, like you want some of this old man? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I just in the car. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I, I. I just I worry about like I mean I'm not worried I'm 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 relishing it as an OU fan, but for them like just for their sake like it's looking like it's gonna be it, this season is gonna be obviously a like a rebuild a project even though they're not you know we've had we talked with Steven fanatic perspective and all they're not you know look they're looking at it as like a win now mode like because that's how any program like that's at the level Texas believes they're at. Uh, should look at it. They should never be looking at it like, oh, we're in a rebuild, kind of trust the process mode right now. Like you're always looking at it as like, no, win now. Like let's like, let's go. Like what's why wait? But they're definitely gonna. I think that Longhorn Faith will definitely gonna have to wait because the problems they've got right now are a little too systemic uh, for a quick fix. So I know I know talking to uh, my aunt, he, he we were talking about some of the stuff we heard on podcast and. One thing he was telling me was that, um, you know, so I forgot who the podcaster was, but he was just saying how Stark usually likes to script the first, you know, eight plus plays of the game. And when you start seeing that script develop or whatnot, that kind of shows you who the big, you know, targets are out there. None of them were wide receivers. <laughs> so, I mean, I just think that you you got to get them help. Here's here's the problem for Texas fans. You got one quarterback that you like, that you loved after the first game, but he's too indecisive. So your problem with him is that he doesn't check down enough, that he won't scramble for more yards uh, uh, after he goes through his progressions. You're banking on Casey Thompson to come in and clean that up because you're saying, well, once he looks at his progressions, he just goes. Well, it's not always a great thing that your quarterback leaves the pocket. <laughs> and trust us, we know that. We yep. definitely know that. We love Spencer to death. And I think Spencer is the number one uh, pick in the draft this year. But when you start looking at some, sometimes you kind of you kind of look at Spencer and you say, hey, man, like we know you got like the coldest arm in America, but like trust your technique, you know. Uh, and same thing with Trey Brown. Technique over <laughs> speed. Come on, man. Yeah. But, you know, 
the, I, you know, for me, I guess I just, just for me personally, Texas, I, I really want, yeah, you know I mean, it's hard because Texas and the next team that we're going to talk about, you want to root for them so they can win, so they can be ranked as high as possible when OU faces them. But it seems like every year, Texas, always, they can do one thing. If, if, if Texas can't win a championship or do anything else, they can do this one thing, which is F up a wet dream. I tell you what. <laughs> um, I just, I don't know. But it, like I said, I mean, it, if you're a Texas fan, you think you got to literally think about it, okay? Do we run? Do we run uh, OP out there? Or do we let a quarterback <laughs> with an S curl lead us to a championship? <laughs> I don't know. But, you know. But, <laughs> but anyways, on to the next team. On to the next thing that we got to talk about, and that's Iowa State. Going up there and doing what Iowa State does best, which is lose to Iowa. I How? I don't know. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. And I pointed this out in several conversations that I had about this game. Iowa State loves to play the same damn game as Iowa. They will go out there and try to beat Iowa at what Iowa does best. Iowa plays the most boring brand of football there is. They just get stuff done. They're not going to wow you with anything, but they're going to get stuff done. The quarterback's never going to be anybody that you're saying, oh my gosh, you should go this high in the draft. You know what he's going to do. Not turn the ball over, check down when he needs to, make a couple of big throws during the game, and hand the ball off. And he's going to be consistent in that manner. He's not going to do anything that wows you. And that's the reason why I don't think that Ohio State is completely out of it. But as of right now, the best team in the Big Ten is Iowa. And the best team two weeks ago in the Big 12 was Texas. Because <laughs> Iowa State struggled. But I digress. Let's get back to it. Yeah. Iowa State, I don't know what to tell you. I This was your chance. This is a big, big moment. Now you're getting knocked down. It's a lot of teams out there where they can't lose. They can't afford to lose any more games. They have no room for error. Clemson, Texas. Ohio State. Ohio State, Iowa State. You have no room for error now. So, with that being said, Seth, what were your thoughts about that Iowa State game? I really wanted Iowa State to win just just because, like, I don't know. It wasn't even a Big 12 thing. It's just like I want to see that program like finally like take the next step because I know they got it in them. Yeah. But they they like like Texas. They are who we thought they were. And I mean, yeah, they just the little brother syndrome in them is probably it might even be worse than it is in Oklahoma State. Like they just for some reason they got they got the best team or the best coach they've ever had in their history, and it's like you wouldn't even be able to tell by looking at the results. Like Charlie, they, Col- Charlie Colar was back. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's just like, it's amazing how like, it's like the psychology that goes on between the, I, I like the, that rivalry and just what, and, and I, and the thing is, is like, because we know that about Iowa State, we also know that they're going to turn it on here in a bit, in a week or two. And they're yeah, going to yeah. roll. And they're gonna look great at the end of the season, but it's like, it's it's always like it doesn't even matter at the end of the season, even if they have a good season, because you you crap you know crap the bed in the beginning of the season, you just kind of set yourself up to like for like you know not being you know in contention of a championship like a national championship at least. So like I, I fully expect them to look great. De- definitely by the time they're playing OU, they're gonna be probably uh, one of the hottest teams in the country, but. It's just, you know, same old song and dance with them. Same old, same old. I mean, you know, I will say this. When Brock Purdy threw that pick, I said, there he is. There he is. There you go, Brock. Come on, Brock. I knew you got to do it. Give me one. You're good for one. You're good for one. You're good for one. Um, No, I mean, hats off to Iowa. I mean, yeah, it was a – it was a, you know, dead even game at one point, and then all of a sudden just the wheels came off. It just – it was a Texas and a Iowa State. Welcome to the – you just got a country boy ass whooping club. <laughs> <laughs> Both of y'all got dominated. And the, the crazy thing is you can understand Texas. I, I can't – we 
we it is well documented that we have talked about this Arkansas and Texas game for months. For months. Go to Fanatic Perspective, go to Nino's Corner, go to Around the Table Sports, and you'll hear us talk about <laughs> Arkansas being a game that Texas can't look past because it's a night game and an SEC school. It's gonna be hell on earth. That is their Super Bowl. That's what they look forward to. Also, I think it's something, it's something noteworthy to point out the fact that Iowa State lost at home in the fashion that they did. Yeah. And that was a great crowd they had too. That was a great crowd. That they had. was game day. All that was it was set up for them to 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 have a, a real true home field advantage, and they just completely dropped the ball. As my uncle D would say, you got to execute, son. You got to execute. <laughs> um, so the last the last team on our list is uh, none other than um, OSU. Excuse me, Ohio State uh, University. Um, <laughs> You know what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You know what? No. Let's go to O State getting lucky against Tulsa. Again. <laughs> I mean, I, I kept saying it during the game. I was on the phone with my uncle and my, my friend was here, and I kept telling him, I said, hey, look, this is where Tulsa's going to lose the game. And I said, it's going to be special teams. And I just said, hey, Tulsa, if y'all can just hang in there and not, if y'all can get to the last two minutes of the game without giving up any type of crazy play in special teams, block punt, uh, miss field goal, and then damn. Well, as soon as I said it, they're going to LB Brown running out the damn field on the uh, kickoff return touchdown. I said, hi, damn it. Can't do anything else in a running game, but he can do that. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. And I think that it's complete bull crap that they called that touchback or whatever the case was whenever OSU got the ball on the one-yard line. How does Smith – I'm like, Spencer Sanders. How in the blue hell do you get all the way down to the one yard line and you fumble? I'm like, <laughs> it's like playing Madden. It's like, what are we doing here? Yeah. But I, I, I don't. I mean, I'm at a loss for words about that team right now. Coming into the season, you everybody screaming Brendan uh, Presley or Presley, Presley this, Presley that, Presley ain't did diddly squat. Um, yeah, him and Josh Moore hanging out. Yeah, him and Josh Moore are hanging out. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. You know, Gundy's on record for saying they have six legit wide receivers who are going to get time. I think that Blaine Green kid that we talked about earlier uh, on one of our earlier podcasts, he's he's injured right now. His brother had a pretty good, uh, pretty big catch. But you're just looking at OSU and saying, man, there's nothing that you guys do that really scares me at all. You guys are back to the same old offensive scheme. You're um, – you know, and people, you know, I thought I heard on the franchise today, somebody, uh, one of the guys was saying that for all the OSU fans out there who were screaming, well, we're just keeping it vanilla. We're keeping it strictly vanilla. You haven't executed even the most vanilla of your play. <laughs> like, geez, our, like Missouri State and Tulsa should, I, I'm just going to be on record for saying it right now. O State is getting blew out by Boise State. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it's looking like. I'm probably right there with you, honestly. I just, I just don't get it. Now we can go to o- now we can go to uh, Ohio State. What's your thoughts about that, Seth? Man, I think my biggest takeaway is just Oregon, honestly, just because they did that. They, they really dominated that game. You know, the, the final score they it was a you know like a one touchdown game, but. They really they were dominant, especially on offense. But I mean, even the defense, I was I was impressed, at least in the first half, the defense, you know, obviously they, they don't have their best player and one of the definitely gonna be a top three pick. Um and the or most likely gonna be a top three pick of the draft, K on Thibodeau. So like not to have him, I mean, it just man, like to do that in the shoe, I loved it. I loved seeing that. Like it was giving me flashbacks of twenty seventeen when know. Baker went up there and planted that flag up there, right there in the center of that O. But yeah, like it was that was that was a great performance. I I, I think I, I take more away from the Oregon's performance mm-hmm. rather than Ohio State's because I think Ohio State I think they're still going to figure it out. But they do I think for as much flack as OU took over the years on defense and you yeah. know oh they can only outscore teams. There hasn't been a, enough talk, I think, on about Ohio State in that same regard. Because, like, th- yeah, their defense hasn't been as bad as OU's was during those really bad years. Like, 
uh, 20, uh, 2018 and such, but uh, it it's it's up there. Like it's getting bad. Like they're they're winning shootouts pretty regularly, or they're getting involved in shootouts pretty regularly. Like I mean, go back to last year, they had a few that uh, Indiana one sticks out to me. Um, I mean, they're just they're they're having a hard time stopping folks, and it's not like they're playing you know Joe Burrow and the 2019 LSU Tigers every week. <laughs> they're playing some some teams that shouldn't be running up the score on them like that. So I think there's definitely some soul searching that needs to go on with the Buckeyes and their and their defense. So a uh, question for you. I got a couple of questions for you. So first question, you can just be brief. We don't need anything long. Yeah, yeah. First question is. What is your biggest problem with CJ Stroud right now? I think just ex- it, just experience. I think he just needs more experience. I think I think I, I actually like a lot of what I've seen from him. Um, so I think it's really just experience. What is your problem? I mean, do you what do you think their struggle is offensively? I guess it's just getting rid of. Um. I don't know. It might be. It might even be like a play calling issue. Like uh, I don't know. Is Brian Day? Is he calling plays? Or is he doing like what Lincoln's doing? I want to say I think so. I think he, yeah. he is. He is. So I think I would. I would go there because it seems like they. They kind of. It seems like they kind of put themselves into bad situations where, mm-hmm. you know, they they don't have success on first down, and then he'll call something that's like or Hase will run something that just like. It would that's not even designed to give get them into like a third and manageable, and then they just find themselves in these weird situations all the time, and and it's like, and it's there's so much to like about their offense because they got like such big play potential, but they just like don't help themselves. It seems like almost every other drive because they're just they're kind of getting themselves in these weird situations where the defense is dictating the you know kind of the call. So I just. I think I think for me, I'd have to like watch more to really, I guess, be more specific about it. But from yeah. just from what I watch, and just from what I see in live, you know, happening live in front of me, it looks like it's just like a it, it might be a play calling or, or situational or something about like that. Would you? Uh, so my last question is right here. It's kind of two part. So would you say the struggle defensively is just the DB room? as far as what that coach is doing, or would you say the problem with Ohio's defense is that they don't have a um, Nick Bosa or Chase uh, Young, kind of or, or Chase or Chase Young, you know, they don't have that guy on that front seven this year. They have right. a collection of guys, you know, like I call this group of uh, this OU's defense, I call them the lunch pill crew. So they have a lunch pill crew themselves in their front seven, but they don't have the guy that year. You think you were, you're hoping that, um, Gosh, uh, Jack Jack Sawyer, you're hoping that he can turn into that, but you're still saying, you know, he still needs more reps, and he's not getting that. So, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think that I think that's a, definitely a great point. Yeah, like they don't have that guy for you know this year. Then that seems like when they do have that guy, the, the it's it's you it kind of permeates through the rest of the defense that like they kind of all it, it's a little bit better. But now that they don't. It's almost like they're trying to find. It's like they're trying to find that guy, or they're trying to make it work with just like a collective effort. But I don't know. It's just like there's just something missing. It, it just, I don't know. Um. Well, I mean, I, I I think that that's the thing. You know, we we like to look at the, um, um, you know, the back half of the defense with the DBs, and you can definitely say that secondary hasn't looked great for the past year and a half some people would even say the past two and a half years um but they've always had that guy up front and i don't think they had that guy up front i think people may be a little bit timid in the running department against them but i think that you're going to see better teams just go ahead and say no i'm gonna run the damn ball i'm not going to be scared of them but i can also throw on you at any time so you're going to be scared of me because of my play action so um, what's that Oregon running back's name that went off on them uh, Verdell. Verdell, yeah. Oh my gosh, man, he ate them up. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, if he wasn't a player of the week, I don't know because he had, he was all over the field. He was all purpose. Yeah. But uh, and I think Oregon had one. They had one uh, running back that looked like Pedro off of Napoleon Dynamite. 
Yeah, but I told my uncle, I said, like, hey, man, I said, he looked like uh, the love child of Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite and Bruno Mars. I was like, <laughs> what is that? What is that? Yeah. Like? But uh, yeah, <laughs> Ohio State. I mean, do you think, okay, so last question. Here's the last question. Do you think Ohio State can win the Big Ten still? Do you, no, no, no. Do you think they're going to win the Big Ten still? I'll say, yeah, right now, yeah. I think. So here's the funny thing, and it's my last thing about Ohio State. It's funny to look at Ohio State because Ohio State is in the same position Oklahoma usually is in. Yeah. Now we have to become fans of our biggest rivals, our most hated rivals, <laughs> and just everybody across the nation because now we need chaos, complete chaos. To yeah. Last year, we're sitting there saying, okay, we're going to drop a game. Just drop a game for you. Now they're looking and saying, okay, Iowa State, go ahead and win that game and let's go. Let's go ahead and get it on. Then we're looking and say, okay, well, if Florida loses, then, you know, by goodness gracious, we can jump. We're a two lost team, but we can jump. Texas A&M. Ohio State, Ohio State hasn't been there. They haven't, they haven't been there since. Was it Dwayne Haskins' year when they lost to Purdue? think so well yeah where they just got completely run up run out of the building yeah but, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, i think yeah. i think dwayne haskins was there yeah rundell moore was running all over the place but they <laughs> yeah. they uh they haven't been in this position in a while so it's foreign to them so now they're they're panicking they don't know what to do but as oh you fans we can definitely tell you it's it's gonna be okay <laughs> yeah yeah so, I, <laughs> You know, it's hard for me to say I'll take the field. I don't think – Iowa is not explosive enough. And yeah. I don't think I, Iowa will get stops, but I don't think they make enough stops to stop uh, to stop Ohio State from winning the, the Big Ten championship. The good thing for Iowa is that I don't believe – I think that Iowa doesn't have Ohio State on their schedule. So. Oh, interesting. <laughs> All right. So, College Pickle, what's up? Here we go. Here we go. Let's. This is a lightning round right here. All right. Here we got. Okay. Cincinnati at Indiana. I'm gonna go with the upset, and that's Indiana, which is kind of funny enough. But yeah, Indi- Cincinnati. They're they're number eight, but I'm I'm gonna go with that upset. Is uh, is Penning still playing? Uh, I think. Did he get hurt? I, I don't even. I don't know if he didn't. I then towards ACL last year, I just wonder. I oh, oh, oh! Uh, actually, I don't even know if he if he's back or not. But I'm still going with him. All right, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna take Cincinnati by ten. Okay, that's probably okay. what's gonna happen. Honestly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my take in West Virginia. Ah oh, man, I'll go West Virginia. I, I think that's. I think that's the upset too. I know Virginia mm-hmm. Tech's ranked so. I'll All go right. with West Virginia, though. I'm going Vontek. Ooh. Okay, Michigan State and Miami. Man, I'll go Michigan State. I'm going Michigan State as well. Purdue and Notre Dame. Man, as much as I hate it, I, I think Notre Dame's going to win that one. I, I want I want Purdue to win so bad. but I mean, Notre Dame hasn't looked great in these past two games. That's true. I should have lost to Toledo. Yeah, I'm going to go with Notre Dame minus three. Uh, South Carolina at Georgia. Ooh, this is this might be a sneaky good one. I mean, South Carolina upset Georgia a couple years ago, so I'll, I'll go. Is is uh, JT Daniels back? Uh, let me see, JT Daniels. Because if he's not, I'm definitely going South Carolina. I guess he's still on the um, on the entry list, as far as what I can see. Screw he's it, I'm. Going- a- I'm going to go South Carolina anyways. Even if he's back, I don't think he'll be 100%. So, I'm going I'm going with the upset. <laughs> go, uh, 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 what's his name? Shane Beamer. Going to get that signature win. <laughs> I think he'll, I think, I think um, JT Daniels will be back. Here's what I say. Um, give me, give me Georgia. Yeah. I hope they lose, though. Um, I know that'd be, that'd be epic. Arizona State at BYU. Oh, this is gonna be a late one. I'm 
I'm going to go BYU. Arizona State looked way, way too shaky to me last week against UNLV. And I think BYU is riding a hot streak now that they beat their rival. Mm, I'm going to go Arizona State. Can't go against Coach Hearn, man. I, believe <laughs> I like Coach Hearn, too. All right. <laughs> now we are down to the big games of the week. Oklahoma yes, State at Boise State. 8 p.m., Boise, Idaho. I hear they got a lot of potatoes ready for it. Yeah, I'm I'm going Boise State. Yeah, I just I I I see them going to the blue turf and coming back black and blue. Like it's 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 gonna be a rude awakening for Mike Gundy. Seth, <laughs> give me Boise State minus eighteen. I'm there. <laughs> Woo! I'm there. Blowout, baby. Blowout. All right, another big game right here. Two thirty game. CBS. Alabama at Florida. Who you got and why? Uh, as much as it would pain me to see Dan Mullen happy if they were to somehow <laughs> somehow pull it off, uh, I think I'm still going to go. Uh, I, well, oh, no, no, no. I'm going with Alabama, but I'm going to be rooting hard as heck for Florida. But I'm I'm picking Alabama. I just I – just, until they actually get beaten, I don't know if I'll ever pick against them, honestly. So here's my thing right here. Alabama – Freshman quarterback, we know that he's pretty darn good. He's going to go down there. It's going to be his first SEC uh, game. It's going to be in the heat. In the swamp. It's going to be 100,000-plus screaming in the, in the back of his, in his ears. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's going to be chaotic for him. Um, first SEC-style defense. Miami has a good defense, but that's not on that day. Right. But, but um, here's my problem with Florida. I don't think you could beat. Uh, I don't think you can go down there and beat uh, Alabama with six. Uh, with, with if you okay, if they go five, go out, set the six. That six. Uh, excuse me. If they were to go uh, five wide, okay, you're basically saying, all right, well, we got five wide receivers out here with a running back in the backfield. So my point with that is, is that I don't trust Emory Jones or this Anthony Richardson kid that Eric, or whatever his name is that people are talking about. I don't think that you can beat Alabama with a two quarterback system like that, especially when you know that they're not avid passers, they're avid rushers. So you're asking them to play a really controlling, concise game and to make uh, and make plays when they need to. I'm not going. To, I mean. At home, yeah, I'm fine, I'm cool, but I'm just not in the in the business of having two quarterbacks who are practically the same. One who's probably a little, my backup's probably a little bit more athletic and maybe just a tad bit more fluent as, at, at passing than my starting quarterback. But I just don't see how you're going to have success against Alabama. You had success last year because you had a willing thrower. You had and you had a really good scheme set up, a good passing scheme. But this year, I, I don't think that you can go in there and say, okay, we're just going to do inside runs with our running backs, quarterback runs, quarterback blast, stuff like that. I think you're going to have to actually air that ball out. And I'm just not in the business of putting two um, dual-threat quarterbacks out there on the field on third and long, third and seven, third and eight, and asking them to make a play to get me a first down. That's not with their legs. So that's how I feel about it. So I got Alabama uh, minus 14. Yeah, I, I I I think they'll get that or more as well. Okay, so we're going to College Station. Excuse me, not College Station. But we're going to State College. Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, for the uh, game of the week, the uh, big game of the week, the ESPN game of the week, <laughs> Auburn at Penn State. Who you got and why, Seth? Who? I think I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Penn State. Uh, and I and I'm not necessarily a big believer in what Penn State's doing right now, but I just I think that I, I think it's going to be kind of like the the Arkansas Texas game where that atmosphere just kind of overwhelms Auburn, and and then also you know I just I I think Bo Picks he's he's good for he's good for a you know a snafu or two going to have a couple turnovers some questionable stuff so he's gonna he's gonna help out Penn State and uh, they're gonna get that win. You know, I've heard people say that he looks more mature. The offense looks fluid. It looks this. It looks that. It's still Bo Picks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told one of my friends like uh, the other other night. Uh, 
uh, he's an Auburn fan. I said, hey, man, how you feeling? He said, feel about what, Chris? And he, was, he already knew where I was going. I said, y'all beat Alabama. He was like, Chris, it was Alabama State. I was like, what? I mean, hey, at least it's not, at least y'all beat a team from Alabama this year because you sure not going to beat the one in Tuscaloosa. Come on, man. What you doing? Be, be happy. What? Yeah, no, nah, man. It, they I, they played all of nobody. So, yeah. Um, I guess we'll see. You know what's crazy is the Auburn's unranked. They may be ranked now. I'm not sure, but, I mean, I don't know. If they go and beat them, I'll be impressed. Yeah, I will be. I would be very impressed if Auburn got that win. Um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm right there with you, but I don't see it happen. I see them I see another SEC team taking an L. <laughs> All right, so we got that out of the way. So, I guess my question is: Do you do you think that Rice can possibly have an upset this weekend? <laughs> nah, nah. Even no matter it, no matter what happened last week, if it, however that game would have turned out between Texas and Arkansas, I just don't. It's it's still Rice at the end of the day, even though we listed all the problems and concerns and issues that Texas has. It's still Rice, but I I, I don't even think it's going to be competitive. Honestly, I think there's a chance it could be like at least for a half. But I don't even think of that. I think I think by the end of the first quarter, it's going to be pretty obvious. Man, we gotta uh, and shoot, we gotta wait all the way till seven o'clock. Is that on the? Is that the Longhorn Network also? The Rice game, probably. Pretty God, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> it is on the Longhorn Network. Nobody's watching that. <laughs> yeah, there'll be like one person watching it, and it's the the TV producer. Who's Man. Nobody's watching that game. <laughs> Good but that uh Seth, you got anything else? Nah, that's it. I'm just I'm ready. I'm ready for football now. All right, people. Hey, when you got like I said, um, I know that you guys probably went crazy over that video that was dropped. <laughs> got Deer's like a thousand Honkle. views. Here's Honkle is the is the hottest thing on the streets right now. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Shout out to my uncle right now, my uncle Tristan. <laughs> it's the hottest thing that dropped on the streets. It's hotter than Certified Lover Boy, Dunda, all of that. It's the hottest thing <laughs> on the streets right now. We selling it, baby. But uh, as you know, always, I am your host, uh, Chris Griffin. You can find me on Twitter at Chris with the K. Yes, it's K C H. You know the rest. Seth, plug yourself, man. Where can they find you at? Yeah, you can also find me on Twitter at Seth Oliveris. And uh, find uh, some of my game previews and such over at crimsonandcreammachine.com. So I'm going to have that Nebraska one up tomorrow. I don't know if my score prediction might change in that. It might. It might not. But um, I I don't think I want to change it just so I don't jinx anything. But, yeah, like that's where you can find me. All right. All right. 42-17 is what I got for that game. All right. Well, anyways, people, it has been a pleasure. Again, I'm your host, Chris Griffin. That is Seth Oliveris over there on the other side of the screen. And uh, as always, horns down. <laughs> 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 <laughs>